Looking for the first signs of spring? Then look no further. The spring issue of Trailblazer magazine ships mid-March. Read the inspiring stories of resilient, gutsy rural women across North America with gorgeous photos to boot. Our spring issue will have you blooming into spring from garden planning to navigating entrepreneurship through the seasons of growth, leaving farm guilt behind when you need a break, to the in-depth look at the lives and businesses of our feature Story Trailblazers, you'll surely be inspired. Grab your copy today at trailblazerco.com. Welcome to the Rural Woman Podcast, a platform for women in agriculture, ranching, homesteading, and more to share their stories. I'm your host, Caitlin Dubin. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Rural Woman Podcast. This week, we're talking to Rachel Stewart. Rachel is the CEO of the Southwest Black Ranchers. In late 2020, Rachel and her family decided to take a leap of faith and bring their longtime dream into fruition, a dream that would not only promote a healthy lifestyle and help their community, but one that would also make history by becoming the first Black-owned protein ranchers in Arizona. On their ranch, they raise primarily sheep, goats, and ducks. Rachel and her family have built a ranch and organization centered on food security and building diversity in agriculture. This quickly transformed into a support network, and now they are developing a food distribution system to help support their network and vision for food security. I so loved my conversation with Rachel. I think you are going to be absolutely inspired by Rachel and her family and their stories and what they are doing for the agriculture industry. Before we get to Rachel's interview, let's go over this week's listener review. This five-star rating and review is titled, This Podcast is the Cluckin' Best. Caitlin, I have been listening to you nearly all day, every day, as I weed gardens at work. I'm starting from podcast one and working my way through. I can't get enough of it all. The messages behind highlighting women in agriculture, regenerative egg, showcasing both big and small, organic and non-organic farming, farming of livestock and plants, is helping shift the way we understand food and think about food waste and overall connecting to our survival sources as a community and species. Thank you for all of the hard work and your time invested in this podcast. You're courageous and cluckin' awesome. I fully use that term now, and my previous potty mouth got a little cleaner thanks to the Rural Woman Podcast, 10 out of 10. Well, thank you so much, Jen, from Northern BC via Apple Podcast. If you have not left a listener rating and review where you listen to the Rural Woman Podcast, I highly encourage you to do this as this helps the algorithms of the podcasting world get the Rural Woman Podcast out to more ears like yours. And a quick Patreon update, I want to say welcome to Rebecca, our newest member of the Patreon community, and a big thank you to Sarah V for bumping up your tier to tier 10. Both Rebecca and Sarah now have the opportunity to get all of the extra audio that is included in the higher Patreon tiers, which include extended episodes, patron-only episodes, and my solo podcast, Maybe You Can Relate, as well as they get ad-free listening, and a bunch of other goodies. So if you want to join Rebecca and Sarah in supporting the stories of women in agriculture to be shared through the Rural Woman Podcast, you can head on over to patreon.com slash the Rural Woman Podcast or scroll down and look for those links in today's show notes. Without further ado, my friends, let's get to this week's episode with Rachel. Hello, Rachel. Welcome to the Rural Woman Podcast. I am so excited to chat with you today. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here, Caitlin. For my listeners who are unfamiliar with you, Rachel, tell us about how you got your start in agriculture. So my name is Rachel Stewart. I'm the mom and the CEO of the Southwest Black Ranchers. 
We are located in southern Arizona on the border of Mexico in a city called Douglas, Arizona. And we started in actually during the pandemic. We started in 2020 and it was due to the food shortages. So when we saw that they were limiting how much food we could purchase, we decided, okay, let's let's make a difference and let's try to become part of the solution and not just, you know, try to increase food for ourselves, but try to increase food for others. And then pretty much the more we dove into the food industry, the more committed we became because we saw there's so many layers and levels to it that it's, I don't see how people can't change their lives when they start learning about this stuff. And now with that, we were able to buy some land and we started to begin farming or we wanted to find a mentor and we couldn't find any mentors. And we found out that there were no black owned farms in Arizona, which is why we chose the name, the Southwest Black Ranchers to help increase representation. And then when we found out that there were, there was like a, a commercial flower farm and there's nonprofits, but there's not any black commercial farms in the state. And even years now into this, we still haven't found one. So it's something that there's so many levels, like I said, in the food industry with issues that everyone's trying to correct. So it's kind of like pick and choose your battles. So so ours, we are, are trying to build food security and diversity in agriculture. In summary. <laughs> that is so true. There are so many battles and there's so many things that we could probably spend all day talking about all of the problems. But like you said, pick and choose your battle. And this is the one that you chose. Yes. So Rachel, what was your exposure to agriculture before you bought your land and started your farm in 2020? What was it like growing up for you? Did you have exposure to agriculture? Kind of. I grew up in Northern California where Chico State is a big agricultural school up there. And there are a lot of farms, but I wasn't in the agriculture scene. And I did do 4-H one year or pigs. That was a very positive experience. But I'm grateful that I was exposed to agriculture at a young age or just even was able to be around it because I see the need and I see the lack of it today for people. You know, and and it was able to help me kind of frame what we're doing now. But I've I've always loved animals, animals, nature. You know, it's kind of been my thing. So now it's it's really it's it's great how life kind of unfolds. <laughs> you know. Yeah, absolutely. So before you bought your ranch, what what were you doing? What was your occupation? Oh, we're into fitness. So my husband, we were personal trainers, and my husband's a bodybuilder. I was getting into bodybuilding as well. And we were about to launch a fitness platform. So he was competing. Actually, we were in Las Vegas competing in February of 2020. And then everything shut down. (laughs) And it really, really changed everything. But, I mean, if your food source is threatened, I I would hope that that would be a life-changing moment for people. You know? Yeah, I think so. Well, and for you, it was a a huge defining moment for you. Your industry basically, uh, depending on where you lived, was completely shut down for quite a while. And for the people who were in that industry really had to pivot and change. And you obviously pivoted and changed to a completely different career. So take us back to the early days of the pandemic and what drew you specifically to make this big change and move to where you are and find this land? Well, with fitness, you know, food is like the the foundation of, you know, our lives. So (laughs) in fitness, you know, it's always like, oh, this many calories or this many macros or, you know, carbs, protein and fat, breaking it down for people and explaining to them how important our food is and the relationship with your food. And then, you know, Protein is really the highest nutrition content food you can eat, okay? And when our meat source was threatened because we could only go to the store and get two packs of meat. So instead of decreasing my trips to the store, actually, I was increasing my trips to the store because I have four children. So, you know, it was down to where I know, like, per how many ounces each child is having, how many meals that many pounds of meat can be made into. And I had everything down to a T, I had made a complete science out of it. And then it was like, okay, now I need to start producing my own. And how can I do this? You know, how, how can I do this for others? And, you know, when you see that there's a whole world outside of the grocery store, 
<laughs> you know, there's a whole there's a whole other world outside of the grocery store, and let alone the theories then on how your meat is produced. It's it's way more than just protein, carbs, and fat. You know, now you can get into the regenerative aspect or how the animal lived or, you know, there's so many more different aspects to it that I wasn't even aware of or familiar with, you know, but at least I just knew that I needed to be a part of the solution. And absolutely, when I looked into the history with the black farming, that's where it was really eye-opening because ranching and the meat industry is the industry that they've been locked out of the most. So I was reading where, like, the last chicken farmer in Mississippi was kicked out of the farming industry, and that was within, like, the last 20 years. So, you know, as much progress as we think they've been made, it's actually, you know, quite the opposite, where people are continuing to lose, you know. And the funny thing is, we think that it could be about, you know, race, and it's not. It's like the small farmer is under attack. You know, and it's it's a thing where I, I was listening to one of your other podcasts and everybody thinks it's just their own individual issue or maybe just that they're not successful with it. But I was able to kind of stand back and I had to look at this industry as a whole before I decided to take this on. And I had to look at it and see, OK, how can I be successful at this and how can I make this successful or make a pathway so it can be successful for my children? Because in the current system, I, I didn't see that. I didn't see that at all. And just wonderful how much we've grown in the past two years and where we are now. So I'm so happy, you know, that you have to go through all these bumps and bruises along the way to kind of develop where you're going. And we're just at a phenomenal place right now where I see the light, but I see that it's not something that is ever going to be given to us. It's something that we have to build it. So like with your podcast, you know, I'm finding that the need to support farmers everywhere is just so big, you know, <laughs> just so big. Supporting farmers everywhere is, is big because what I do now is I aggregate for small farmers. So I help them sell their products because I want to help them be more profitable as well. and. I see that for the black farming, it's, it's worse than we imagined in the sense that we're not set up to be able to receive, if that makes any sense. So I, I know this is like a ramble, but like all I do is talk to farmers all the time, like all day long. It's farmers, farmers, farmers and ranchers and local food and how, how try to help people be successful because I just see like this looming crisis and I'm like do people do you see this <laughs> does anybody else see this <laughs> you know where we're just like working trying to work with people to to solve these issues these unsolvable issues you know right yeah well you've said so many incredible points here it's hard to keep track of them all Rachel they're all so good <laughs> but like I go back to you know, when you were looking for mentorship and when you were looking for people to talk to, and there was nobody in your state that you could find that nobody. was a black owned farm or ranch. And to know that you could feel so lonely there is, is so hard to hear. And it's so hard to understand. And the fact that now you have built something not only for yourself and for your family, but you've also given a pathway to others to be able to know that this is possible and that you can do this, even if you do feel like you're on your own, regardless of your race or your gender, knowing that there's other farms out there that feel alone and feel like they're struggling. But, you know, coming on platforms like this and sharing your story on social media and doing all the other good work that you're doing, you are building this community and you are building resilience to all of these barriers that have been put up for you. And I just think that what you've done in the last two years is absolutely incredible. And to think that this can still be done in the day and age that we live in, and you can be successful at doing it 
And it is hard, but you can push through and do it. I just think, you know, I fangirl over you all of the time of all of the things that you've been able to accomplish in relatively a really short amount of time. It has been, right? (laughs) It's it's like been such a short amount of time, but it's like such necessary work where now I think we're just starting to get support and it's really about to start taking off. And there's so many like different aspects to it. So that's why it's like, I'm so glad my husband helps ground me all the time. (laughs) You know, it's like, it's like one thing at a time, but like, yes, it is possible and it has to be possible because then there's no other way, you know, what are the alternatives? You know, I live in a food desert. So where the county we're in produces so much agricultural food, but it's all shipped out and none of it is made available to the people. And then let alone on, like, on that note, we're on the border of Mexico, and the city in Mexico has a lot higher population than our city over here. So it's kind of like they're sister cities, but, like, I don't know how else to say this, but they're both looked down upon the same, according to our local region, you know? And I'm in these city meetings, and I'm in these food systems discussions And the way that, like, our area gets discounted all the time, it's like I look at these things as it's not it's not just a bad area or a bad place. You know, there's so much opportunity to be had here because people just don't even realize it. And I work with, you know, people who are trying to get into agriculture all the way up to people who are are pretty successful in agriculture. And I see that we all get burnt out. We all have problems. We all you know, don't know, maybe we've all reached our ceiling at certain points, you know, or we all have our, our, our own issues, you know, but it's, it's finding the, the commonality and being, and who's actually willing and wanting to work with you, I think, you know, because we, everybody gets so stuck into their own bubble or their own farm or their own life where they don't really think about others, I think. And that's why I love, like, your podcast, because if you're doing anything to support agriculture right now, that is everything, you know? it's It really is, because you are a reference for people. You have been a reference for me. You know, you, you've you been a reference for me, because how else would I be able to go out there and find what people are doing? Because I learned from experience, just like I think a lot of other people do, and you can learn from your own experience or others' experience. You know, and how do we know what exists until we see it, you know, or we hear about it? So it's just amazing. I love looking at food systems from around the world and learning what people are doing or what's going on, you know, in your neck of the woods. And, oh, my gosh, I just learned so much. We just went from San Diego to Georgia touring farms. And the world is, not only is it like, it's so amazing, but it's just so different. And there's so many different struggles or different things that we all deal with for our region. You know, like out here, hay is like our our most expensive issue or our most expensive item. But then, you know, I go over to like Mississippi and Georgia and Texas, and it's like, they just have so much hay, they don't even know what to do with it. It's just, it's so funny, you know, the, the different issues that we all have trying to produce, you know, and trying to, like, wrap my head around how we can make things work. But um, a really motivating person that I just got in contact with who I'm going to be working with soon, she was telling me that, you know, we have a responsibility, that those of us who know better and who have the ability, we have the, the responsibility to do it, you know. And she, she's amazing. She's actually a doctor who's helping me plan our food safety program for our aggregation platform. So I'm I'm really excited to be working with her. Something I don't let people know very, very much is that I also do like the butchering and the slaughtering. Like that is something that I love to do, but I don't, I don't know. I feel weird talking about it, I guess. (laughs) Well, this is the platform to talk about it on because there's other people here who also enjoy that. So Let's dive into what you are producing on your ranch and the meat that you are producing. And you can dive in and be all nerdy about the butchering yes, process, too. Yes, please, please, because it's like I don't have anybody to talk to about this stuff. You know, it's like it's like you just kind of do it on your own. But 
So we raise sheep and goats and ducks. So really we have a lot more than that, but that is what we specialize in. I mean, we have like turkeys, alpacas, chickens, cows, pigs, and things like that. But our, our specialization is in the goats, the sheep, and the ducks, or the duck eggs. Because we're trying to, you know, raise our own sources of protein. And the sheep, oh my gosh. So now we have close, we have over 50 heads, for sure. I know that. <laughs> and we're lambing now. So we have like baby lambs and goats being born all the time. It's just so funny when you finally cross a threshold and you're just like, okay, I guess I'm a real rancher now. And then you know, my husband was telling me, I think the other day, he's like, I guess this is just what it's going to be from now on. You know, we're just going to be constantly having babies all the time. And I said, yeah, I, th- I think so. You know, <laughs> and it's it's just so great to, to be at this point. But then you get into like, how big do you want your sheep to be and how many are coming out and, and what are your returns? But but really, the the sheep are just, they're my favorite. I, I'm a big nerd when it comes to the animal sciences. So So let me tell you some details about our sheep. Okay, so we have hair sheep, and they are very hardy. I fell in love with them, and I'm just so lucky that I was exposed to some solid ranches, and I got some really solid starter starter lines. So I had sheep from a few different ranches, but they actually looked alike because they were different hair breed mixes. And so now we've just kind of been able to grow those, so it's like a mix of Katahdin, Black Belly, St. Croix, and there's a little bit of Dorper in there. But yes, so for, for meat, then we we started selling our meat. So we got into the meat processing, and I know how to process. It's something we can do, but I want to follow all of the food safety guidelines. And we wanted to process at USDA. But with the pandemic... All of the USDA in my state was shut down except for two beef locations. So then we had to start reaching out to California and New Mexico, and we still couldn't find anyone to process our meat. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, this is how bad it is that we can't get, like, food safety guidelines met. So now I'm trying and working to get a processing facility here for us to use. But in the meantime, it actually forced us to grow, and now I'm working with farms, ranches in California and selling meat in California that is USDA slaughtered, processed. So so I have meat in San Francisco that's selling. I'm working on selling meat out over down in Texas and then still getting my facility going over here. So it's kind of like spread our location, if that makes sense. (laughs) And our meat that we just sold over in San Francisco it was part of our, our beta test, and that one was able to provide four local jobs, the one sale, and we were able to turn it on profit. So I'm really, really happy about that one. It is so incredible to me the amount of work that has been done in such a short amount of time, and especially for your area of having essentially a food desert when we know that how much is produced out of your area and like you said is just completely shipped out and i know there were so many small farms and ranches that had so many similar problems to you in not being able to have a processing facility that was able to process you know as consumers you heard that there was these food shortages and there was all of these things it wasn't the shortage of food it was a shortage of processing <laughs> facilities and infrastructure to get these animals to where they needed to go. So, so many people lost so many things due to the lack of what happens off of the farm or ranch. Yes, exactly. And then, you know, the extra strain of having to feed the animals longer or taking the losses, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. So that is why, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to get into the processing part, like, a lot, you know, and, and make, making sure that we can have streamlined operations in several locations so that way we can make sure people can get food, you know. And then on this trip, we ended at, so it's so great. I'm so grateful. I was able to get it sponsored by Liberty Overalls and by Renew Arizona, a renewable energy company down here. 
and also Vitalist Arizona and Pinnacle Prevention. But we ended at a regenerative meat event over in Georgia where it was full of like on-farm slaughter and we got to learn about where every every animal breakdown is a postmortem like autopsy where we make sure that the animal is healthy because that's what the inspectors are there for is to help make sure you know that the food is safe and that everyone you know gets the nutrition that they want from their meat so i got to learn you know from the inspector how things should look and that's who i'm going to be working with in the future also so i'm really really excited but you know just learning all full full cycle the animal health you know we we all are on this planet and it's like being a steward of the land is is everything to me you know it's it's being you know the animal husbandry to taking care of the land the soil all of it and i want my facility to be hopefully a, like a no shoot facility that's what my goal is to, to be doing lamb and goat down here in a no shoot facility and where it's processed and being being able to work with the earth to create a better habitat for the animals down here. I like like zoos and like riparians and things like that. So I really work hard on my ranch with biomimicry to help give them a really a good environment where they kind of just roam. You know, they have pens, but they sleep in them. And then it's really just kind of like who we let out at different times because of who's okay to range or, or, or go out together. I was with a photographer the other day and he said, it's really easy to film the animals here because they're all friendly. And that's what I want is it's something where it doesn't have to be like the typical, you know, where it it can be a place where people come learn experience and and they can, they don't have to associate what they only see on TV. Humane handling is everything for me, (laughs) really. It really is. And It's so interesting to me when, you know, you have people from the outside world come in and see what it actually looks like on your operation and how that may differ from somebody else's operation. And, you know, they might have just learned from the way that their parents did it and the parents before them did it, but kind of opening your eyes and learning from different people and different experiences, I think really helps you know, shape the way that food is produced in the future. So I'm curious, who have been some of your biggest mentors that you've been able to reach out and find to help you along in your journey? Mm. I just try to learn everywhere. You know, I take classes a lot from the cooperative extensions around the country. So I like the University of Minnesota's cooperative extension because they do a lot with sheep and goats. And on this tour, we stopped at three universities and were able to look at their sheep and goat facilities because we're hopefully opening up a sheep and goat feedlot. So that way we can, you know, expand and commercialize it and actually be, you know, the first Black-owned commercial ranch here in the state. So we're we're talking to the FSA agency about that as well. But who the biggest influences, it's hard. It's hard because... There's not, there's not really a lot of them. You know, I just kind of take from, take from bits and pieces. One of my biggest influences actually has been internationally. I really like Farmer Angus over in South Africa. I saw one of his TED Talks before we came out and started ranching. And it was where I learned that he, he left being a stockbroker to get into farming. Once he learned about how the, the truth about the food system and, you know, what's going into our food, and he actually donated his egg farm to his black employees because there's not even black farms like that in Africa. So he's really trying to help promote that as well. So I, I he's been he's been a really big inspiration as far as that for me. And I like his out of the box thinking. He also integrated his feathers in the soil. And I'm seeing like how important I haven't been able to grow crops yet. Because we haul water, so surprisingly, plants take, like, way more water than animals. So <laughs> it's, like, insane how much water the crops use over animals. So it's, like, if we wanted to do a gravity feed system, then we can. But the way we let our livestock range, it's I had have to set up really strong barriers and things like that to, to grow over here. Let's see. I'm trying to think who else has been a, a big influence 
you know, it, it's hard. My husband says that we have to drive bulldozers because there's nobody who led the path for us. You know, I applied for this one grant and the grant told us that we weren't cultural enough. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I don't know how it can be any more cultural. It's such a multicultural family, you know, and all we do yeah. is, is like learn when, when you don't have a history, like you have to build it and you have to learn it and you have to make it, you know, and when you don't have like grandparents or people to go to, to talk about these things, you know, it's like you, you have to make it. And it's funny how I, I see how close some people have been to agriculture and then how far removed they are because people will start opening up and talking to me and say like, Oh, you know, my grandparents had a farm or, you know, my family had a farm. And then I started thinking about it. And I, and I do remember that my grandfather, he told me that he grew up on a tomato farm in Southern California, but I guess I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second because it's a big realization, but there's, there's a lot of our family members who, you know, grew up in farming and they were taken away or they left and went to the cities, you know, and they did, did a study in, by the university of North Carolina. And in that study, they realized they linked the loss of black farmland all the way up to the 1980s to the mental health issues in the black community. So, to me, that's huge. And my, I'm Filipino, and my grandfather, he came over from World War II from the Philippines after they were attacked over there, and they they had, like, gardens here and things like that. But my other grandfather, during that time, he was a child on a tomato farm in Southern California, and they were put in an internment camp, and they lost their farm. And... It's just interesting because it's like we and I've never had any any agriculture to do with him, you know. And then I realized my father he actually walked with Cesar Chavez with the farm workers movement, and he had the farm workers tattoo on his leg. But these are things that like we just kind of like brush off, you know, movements that were to help farming or to try to help people because we get stuck in like regular the regular world, I guess, you know, and and back disconnected from our food. And it's funny because my, my grandfather, he would always tell me, like, you can be a bean counter or you can be the one who tells the bean counters what to do. And I was thinking about it last night and I was like, no, I want to grow the beans, Grandpa. <laughs> you know, it's like, but conveying that to people, conveying that there's a strength in it. It's not, it's not just something that we have to, like, run from or hide from or... It has to be a sad thing for our families. You know, I'm really, I want this to be a place of strength for people again. And I realized that I have to build that bridge. And it's not an easy bridge. It's not an easy bridge because there's so much like hurt and issues. But if we don't build, like my husband gets so mad at, um, <laughs> he gets so mad at the same terms that everybody uses. Like, oh, like diversity or equity or inclusion, like all of these things. He's like, I hate all these terms and I hate all of this stuff. And I'm like, I love it because I like it for what it is and that the general root and what it's trying to build. And I think that if you do build these things right, then it can have the desired effect. But I think it has to be who it's coming from, you know, who it's coming from and then and, and making sure that it's not the same. Because people people aren't dumb and they can see and feel when things are not genuine, you know, and they don't want to be trapped in the same system that has been or that was, you know. So it's like building these conversations around healing and building these conversations around a positive future and not in something that divides us. It's like a delicate balance, you know, because there's so many people who want to support and they, they don't know how because... I don't know if you've seen that meme about equity and talking about how there's like, there's a fence and there's people looking, one person high up overlooking the fence, one barely peeking over the fence. And then one who's like, can't even see over the fence. And then saying, you know, there's some people who are not even on the field. And that's how I feel about the farming. And there's so many people who are just not even on the field. And that's, I guess, where my drive comes in <laughs> is I want to help us all get on the field. <laughs> where we can 
we can build, grow, and where there is more food, you know. But it's it's definitely a lot. So that's we, where we where we are now, I guess, is having built this system for people to help them kind of get in and understand and make it a little bit easier for them so they can be successful and not get trapped up on the pitfalls in a system that wasn't really made for us to be successful in in the first place. You know? Exactly. Thank you for standing on that soapbox. And thank you for driving that bulldozer. Because I think the authenticity and the genuine intent behind what you are doing is really showing and proving to people that with the right tools, you are able to be successful and you are giving people the right tools and showing them the way of building something for themselves and for their families. So in the future, they have that history to look back on. Like you said, you don't have the history in the space that a lot of people do. And you are now creating that history and that legacy for your children moving forward to be successful and to help those around them and help others create food systems that do work for us today. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And it's like only because of people like you where these important conversations are actually had. You know, or else people don't really, I mean, I want it to get to people who care. (laughs) Hopefully the message does, you know, and I feel like the people who are connected to you, they they all care. You know, you you make a really big difference, especially for women. Gosh, this is, this has not been a women-led industry, huh? (laughs) Well, those women have been behind the scenes and have not been the faces that people connect to when they think of our industry, when really our stories have been a big backbone to what has made our industry what it is today. And those stories haven't been celebrated enough. So as much as, you know, I've done and how much I continue to do and work, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do enough on my own. So that's why I'm so grateful to women like you and the other women that I've been able to connect with that continue to share their stories on their platforms. And I am I am just a piece of the puzzle. And uh, I hope to continue to build a bigger picture in agriculture and help people realize that there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. And there's a lot of heart that goes into our industry that is is not shared enough. So I'm just happy to be here with you and to be able to share that story. So much so. It's not even funny how hard this stuff is. That's why it's like, I, I appreciate food production at every level, but I've really, really tried hard to make sure that people realize what we're building is a farm or a commercial ranch. It is, I'm not, this is not a hobby. This is not for fun. This is not, you know what I mean? This is, this is life. And when I heard you talking with somebody else about just the mental health issues and just, you know, the seriousness of how you relate to your farm and it's, this is life, you know, (laughs) this is life and people don't know how hard it is to get food to people. (laughs) It is so hard. It is. And for you to be somewhat, you know, of an outsider coming in as a first generation rancher and business owner and all of these things, you know, I feel like we have that advantage because we didn't know what we didn't know beforehand. We didn't know how hard this actually was going to be. Whereas the people who grew up and lived this way, and this has been their whole life, they've known all along, but they haven't really known how to communicate that with others. And now that the others are coming into this industry and seeing, I feel like there's the advantage for us to share our stories and connect with people who, you know, don't know this lifestyle and to be able to share that with them to say, like, this is actually how much work it takes to get that steak on your plate. Yes, exactly. Man, it's like, so when we went to San Diego, we visited the only Black-owned farm in San Diego County, and it's awesome. It's another actually Black and Filipino couple, too. And when we got there, their vehicle had been stolen. Like, their farm truck was, they had police had just left, and their their, their on-farm vehicle was stolen on off of their, like, avocado and, and blueberry farm. I just, I couldn't believe it. And then... 
this one rancher that we're working with in Texas, you know, he was telling us about his tractor and he showed it to me and he was telling me all the things he did to his tractor. And then when somebody sat on it, all the tires popped. And and how his tractor wouldn't even do it. This is like so sad. I was like crying when I told me this. His tractor, his tractor wouldn't even do like a full like twenty acres. It would get like halfway through, and he'd have to stop. So by the time he was always do- done with one side, it would be like time for the other side. And it was just, it's just crazy. Like the dedication that that these people have. I just feel like they're the most amazing people. You know, I, and I just. I can't, I wouldn't want to work with anybody else, you know? It's very true. It's very true. Once you get into the industry and see how much heart and soul there is into absolutely everything that farmers and ranchers do uh, for their animals and for their land and really for for everyone. And with no support, really, <laughs> with no support, it's just, it's just incredible. And, you know, everywhere there's a public and a private and just to see that that this is who's made it, you know, these people have made it and these are who are making our food, you know, it's, it's, it's really powerful. It's powerful to connect even with you all the way over in Canada. I'm so, I'm so honored. (laughs) This is so great. The feeling is very, very mutual, Rachel. Hi, Jan and Aaron here from Trailblazer Co. Are you looking for the first signs of spring? Then look no further. The spring issue of Trailblazer magazine ships mid-March. Spring is the time of renewal, and have we got you covered. Read the inspiring stories of resilient, gutsy, rural women across North America with gorgeous photos to boot. From Garden Planning 101 to navigating entrepreneurship through seasons of growth, leaving farm guilt behind when you need a break to the in-depth look at the lives and businesses of our feature story trailblazers you'll find a part of yourself in every story and feel connected to a whole community of rural women living just like you so get your copy and feel inspired and empowered as you immerse yourself in this wholesome rural way of life our spring issue of Trailblazer will inspire you to greet the new season with purpose and some cool new ideas to help your life bloom into 2022. Grab your copy and a subscription today at trailblazerco.com. I want to take a minute now and for you to reflect on the past two years and what are some of the things that you want to celebrate that you are most proud of that you have accomplished on your ranch? So some of the things that I'm the most proud of is that I was able to get every single animal that I brought onto the ranch or every type of animal to breed naturally. So I was able to create an environment where they were able to successfully breed and that because I wanted to be able to learn that and then I wanted to be able to grow that and, and figure out, you know, what is the best natural environment for them. You know, to me, animals are like, I just, I love them so much. And I want, I like things that are half wild, if that makes sense. <laughs> I like them to have a heart and I like them to to want to live. So, so I don't want something that just kind of sit there and just eat or die, you know? So that was the big privilege for me. And my and for my animal my animals my children <laughs> my animals too and also uh, the the proudest moment for me was when we were on our farm tour and my children were able to give or take care of the sheep in labor so they were staying here with my friend and she had no idea what to do <laughs> but the ch- the kids they they made sure that everybody was good and everything was taken care of and now i just feel like they're pros they they do everything on the ranch and i guess my kids they're the biggest thing that i'm proud of because i'm raising them to be that is so great and i don't want them to let go of this life you know so yeah that's the the biggest thing those are so great and Honestly, that is so neat that they were able to help out during that uh, <laughs> time of need for the sheep. And your poor friend was probably like, what did I sign myself oh up for? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes. She was going crazy. She She's a, a veteran as well. So uh, we're not <laughs> veterans, but the event we went to was for veterans. And we just really support our veterans. And it's just so funny that she was like, 
she was like putting my kids through military school <laughs> when they were here when she was watching them. And then when she was done, she just said, I have so much respect for you guys. She said, I cannot believe all the stuff that you guys do. But she did a great job. You know? <laughs> yes. That is so good. <laughs> she gets a big uh, <laughs> birthday present, Christmas present this coming year. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I want, I want her permanently. <laughs> yes, no doubt. For the listeners who would like to support you and the work that you do, where can they find you online and what can they do to support you and your ranch? We are on, mainly on Instagram. So our, our handle on Instagram is Southwest Black Ranchers. We just filed our nonprofit. So it's called People First Global Food and Land Reclamation Foundation. So that is what we are going to be building our platform with. I'm also starting a podcast with it to try to help people understand land, the beginning farming, things like that, and food systems issues from around the world. You know, so anybody who wants to, to give or support, you can find us that way and contact me because I am looking for brands and people, uh, organizations who see the need for the diversity, um, for the equity, for the inclusion and the justice, for the, all of it to support us through, through those channels. That is so good. And I will put all of those links in the show notes so people can find you and connect with you and support you. Thank you. Oh, and on Instagram, the um, the nonprofit, I think it's called The Foundation is what it's called. On there. Yeah. Perfect. There's a link on our profile. Thank you so much. Rachel, my last question for you is what is the most rewarding part about being a rancher for you? Uh, being a part of of the cycle of life. That is the most rewarding part. You know, the beginning part, the ending part, all of it. This, I, I don't know any the, anything else that would be as rewarding. Probably just being a mom, you know, is, is they're, both, they're both good things. <laughs> but I put being a rancher up there with being a mom because, you know, that's how, how much you care about your animals and how much you care about your job and you take this seriously. So, yeah, definitely the animals are my favorite part. Yes. I agree. Animals are the best part of agriculture, especially if you didn't get to grow up with like a goat in your backyard. Now having them in your backyard, I think it's pretty cool. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I am a total goat head. Something a little quick tidbit for you is we are friends with Dr. Frank Pinkerton, who he goes by the goat man and he built goat systems around the world. So he also is a part of um, Goat Rancher magazine. And when we were at Prairie View A&M, we got to see an international goat facility that he built. So I was just so honored and privileged. And then we went over to LSU, Louisiana State University, and met with one of his really close friends, Dr. Ken McMillan, who is a meat scientist, who we got to meet with as well. But I was just it was straight goat talk the whole time. It was goat breeds, goat kidding, everything, <laughs> all, everything goats. I see you have goats too, so I know you're, and you have babies. Yes, baby goats. They were, they're really fun. They're big babies now, but. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I always find, like, when you find goat people, like, we have, you typically have lots in common or lots to talk about. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story today. It has been truly my honor and privilege to be able to get to chat with you and to have this community built. Uh, and hopefully we uh, were able to surround you with the love and support that you need. So thank you again so much. You were. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Rural Woman Podcast. A special thanks to our Patreon executive producer, Sarah Reedner of Happiness by the Acre, and to my editor, Max Hofer. For show notes, head on over to wildrosefarmer.com. You can connect with me on social media using the handle at wildrosefarmer on all platforms. If you love the show, make sure you're subscribed wherever you listen to podcasts, plus share it with a friend. We'll see you next time. Did you know that you can get this same great episode of the Rural Woman podcast ad-free? I get it. 
Listening to ads during a podcast isn't always my favorite either, but in order to keep the lights and coffee pot on here at the Rural Woman Podcast Studios, they are necessary. I am so grateful to each and every one of my sponsors, but if you yourself would like to skip the ads while supporting the show, consider joining me over on Patreon. Patrons of the Rural Woman Podcast get ad-free episodes starting at Tier 5 on their podcast player of choice each week, plus some other great benefits. Find out more by heading to the link in today's show notes to learn how you can become a patron through Patreon.